Jambor, the dream of a young man with the heart of a medieval knight and the mind of a Renaissance patron. The pleasure palace of a king who sought empire and women with equal passion. During the day, the cries of the royal hunt filled the air. At night, music and whispers of intrigue and romance filled the halls. Join us for a tour of this jewel on the French crown, next on Great Castles of Europe. This is the fertile, sunny valley of the Loire River. The Loire runs through the heart of France, both geographically and spiritually. It was here that in the course of a century of war with England, the idea of France as a nation took shape. Here that the enemy was turned back. And it was here that the kings and queens of France chose to build the most beautiful castles in the world. The year, 1520. France prospers under its new king, a young man with a taste for architecture, beautiful women, and the hunt. He has endless ambition for himself and his country. He hopes one day to be an emperor, another Charlemagne. He is determined to make French culture the envy of Renaissance Europe. He conceives of a fantastic creation in the midst of this game-filled forest. The largest, most extravagant, most modern construction of its day. An incomparable palace to astonish the world for generations to come. Chambord. With its many turrets, dormers, and towers, the chateau has been likened both to an overcrowded chessboard and a woman whose hair has been blown loose by the wind. Surely the romantic young king whose dream gave birth to Chambord would have preferred the latter account. Francis I was barely 20 years old when he succeeded his cousin to the throne in the year 1515. Raised and indulged by his widowed mother, Francis grew up steeped in the blossoming arts of the Renaissance. He grew to love tales of knightly bravery and courtly love more than his Latin letters. He preferred the thrill of the hunt to the finer points of statecraft. But he was intelligent and good-hearted, and after a long line of drab and sickly monarchs, the people of France were delighted with their dashing young king. Shortly after his coronation, Francis set off to Italy to win back the Duchy of Milan, which had been lost, regained, and lost again by his family. To the astonishment of all of Europe, he succeeded. During his triumphant tour of Milan, Francis saw firsthand the works of the Renaissance artists and architects he'd learned of as a child. He returned to France with more than a victory, taking home a passion for the things of the Italian Renaissance and dreams of equaling them in his own realm. He even succeeded in persuading an aging Leonardo da Vinci to accompany him back to France, along with the famous painting La Giconda, better known as the Mona Lisa. With Leonardo's help, Francis set about fulfilling his architectural dreams, first by enlarging this castle at Blois. But Blois belonged to his queen and his children. His stature as a Renaissance monarch demanded that he have his own stately castle, the likes of which Europe had never seen before. His eye would settle on the outskirts of the great forest of Chambord. Some say it was the love of a woman that brought him here, his illicit affair with the beautiful countess who lived nearby. It's just as likely that the abundant game lured Francis to Chambord. 
And although the marshy ground made the building site less than ideal, Francis had made his decision. His castle would go here. In 1519, workers began the daunting task of clearing and enclosing the estate. They built a 21-mile wall around the grounds, an enormous undertaking that encircled an area the size of Paris. It was a magical time. Francis seemed destined for greatness. Already he was being called a second Charlemagne. But in Germany, another young man was assuming a position of power, a new ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. Just 19 years old, he controlled both Germany and Spain, but longed for more. France and its ambitious young king stood in the way. No one knows exactly who designed Chambord. Clearly, it bears the mark of Leonardo da Vinci, but he died just before construction began in 1519. Leonardo's death was a blow to Francis, who revered the artist. One historian movingly describes how the young king held the dying Leonardo's head in his last moments. In truth, Francis was far away, celebrating the birth of his second son when news of Leonardo's death reached him. The design of Chambord reflects Francis's desire to remake the Italian Renaissance in a French image. The square keep is Italian, but the massive corner towers are French medieval. The room plan is unique, centering on a Greek cross that divides the keep into four separate blocks. Where the arms of the cross meet, a magnificent spiral staircase rises. It's constructed so cleverly that someone ascending can see those descending without ever meeting them, because there are actually two flights of stairs wrapped around each other. This is the genius of Leonardo da Vinci. These drawings by Leonardo show a staircase designed with four distinct flights of stairs. It's likely that the great artist drew these for Chambord, but the master masons overseeing the construction of the chateau simplified the design to just two flights. The staircase remains a marvel of engineering and ingenuity to this day. The resulting castle would be all Francis had hoped an astonishing combination of French tradition, Italian Renaissance, and the genius and whimsy of Leonardo. Of course, Francis made sure that his own mark would be prominently displayed throughout the castle. Another symbol of Francis adorns the castle throughout, the salamander. In legend, the salamander walked through fire unscathed. Francis's mother chose it as a symbol of strength and courage for her son. Here, too, the young king's fierce ambition for empire can be seen. Above the head of each beast is a closed imperial crown, an audacious mark for a mere king. In truth, only his grim young rival, Charles V, would wear the imperial crown. Francis and his castle would pay dearly for his imperial ambitions. In 1525, at the Battle of Pavia, the fates went his enemy's way. Francis was wounded and captured. For a year, he languished in a Spanish prison, and building at Chambord came to a halt. In 1526, Francis was able to return to Chambord, more anxious than ever to finish his palace. He had won his release at great cost. Part of France went to Charles V, and Francis's two sons went as hostages as well. It was probably during these visits to the building site that Francis decided to add wings to the square keep. Perhaps only then did he realize that the perfect symmetry of the keep had its drawbacks. It divided the chateau into 32 identical apartments, and a king with dreams of empire could hardly live in exactly the same accommodations as his subjects. To preserve that neat symmetry, Francis would add two wings, one for the royal apartments and one for the chapel. Thus, the new design would pay tribute to both God and king. But the symmetry is deceptive. A close look at the main facade reveals the royal wing to be slightly smaller than the wing containing the chapel. 
it's thought that the marshy ground may have forced the builders to lay the foundation for the royal apartments closer to the keep than had been planned. There are other differences in the wings, best seen in the matching staircases on either side. The richly carved one ascending to the royal apartments dates from the 1540s. The one on the opposite side, completed 15 years later, is markedly simpler in decoration. From 1526 on, 1,800 men labored continuously on the building of the chateau. The pleasure palace at Chambord gradually took shape and was readied to greet its first visitors. Francis I was never quite the same after his imprisonment in Spain. The ceaseless struggle with his mortal enemy, Charles V, took its toll. He was no longer the light-hearted knight. Hunting, one of the great delights of his youth, increasingly became an escape from troubles on his frontiers. And so he and his sumptuous court came to Chambord on such escapes. During the summer, Chambord lay empty. Hunting was a winter pastime. The king would organize hunting trips for his court that lasted from a few days to a few weeks. Hundreds of servants and perhaps a thousand horses would move from chateau to chateau, lugging all of the furniture, tapestries, chandeliers, clothes, and china that such a royal gathering would require. Readying the chateau for the arrival of the king's court was no simple task. Typical of Francis's flair for the grandiose, the numbers of the court swelled during his reign, including many women of rank. He was fond of saying that a court without beautiful ladies was like a spring without roses. Eventually, his retinue filled every room in the keep, including these large attic rooms. On arrival, the servants would set about transforming the chilly stone castle into a warm and welcoming palace, lighting the fireplaces in each room, hanging tapestries and thick velvet wall coverings. The servants would fit slats of wood into these slots and plaster them with mud and grass. Markings on the beams guided the reassembly. It's no coincidence that the roof beams resemble the ribs of a boat. The roof was built by shipbuilders who worked on the castle during the winter months when the shipyards were closed. Construction of the royal wing was not completed until 1547, the same year Francis died. He may have stayed here in the magnificent king's bedroom during his last visits to Chambord that year, surrounded by those closest to him. In those times, the king might share his bed not only with his wife, but with a favored guest as well. Privacy was not considered a luxury. A retinue of servants surrounded the king, whether he was holding court, hunting in the woods, or asleep in his bed. At night, the servants would sleep in foldable cots around their lord's bed. Francis's presence can be felt everywhere here. The king's study, attached to the bedroom, was designed to offer him a retreat from the hubbub of the court. The richly carved ceiling bears his initial, F, and his totem, the salamander. The king's passion for architecture did not stop at Chambord. In fact, no other French monarch would build as many castles, but it was here at Chambord that his vision of a holy French Renaissance reached its pinnacle. Here, Francis spared no expense, no effort. Here he indulged every flight of architectural fancy. In many ways, Chambord is as impractical as it is beautiful. Certainly the chateau was not designed with the servant's convenience in mind. No permanent kitchens were built, since the castle was left empty except for a week or two a year. Servants had to cook food in fireplaces in the basement and then carry it up staircases and down long halls to reach the royal apartments. More often than not, the food arrived cold. 
Therefore, in rooms adjoining each main apartment, so-called potagers were built. Here, the food could be rewarmed. Chambord's finest moment, and perhaps Francis's only real triumph over his rival, Charles V, came in 1539. During one of the short-lived truces between the two, Francis threw a week-long reception for his mortal enemy. It is said that swarms of young ladies preceded the emperor wherever he went, scattering rose petals in his path. Charles was suitably impressed declaring Chambord and its trimmings a synthesis of all that human effort can achieve. On the occasion of such royal visits, days were filled with the hunt. According to tradition, the unique terraces at Chambord were constructed so that the ladies of the court could follow the hunts and admire the gallantry of their lords. It is more likely that these are another mark of the great Leonardo da Vinci, designed to provide a perfect vantage from which to marvel at the forest of fantastic shapes rising from the upper level. Nights at Chambord were for feasting and frolicking. Guests would gather on and around the spiral staircase, whispering and shouting. On the second floor of the keep, music and dancing filled the rooms radiating from the staircase. At night, during the great balls held here, Chambord took on the air of the fairy tale palace of Apollodon the Magician, a character from a 14th century Spanish novel of romantic chivalry. Francis had it translated from its original Spanish, and his court gallantly set about emulating it. Chambord's flamboyant outlines might have come straight out of an illuminated medieval manuscript. They capture the romantic mood of a passing age that Francis, the great Renaissance patron, never stopped celebrating. The death of Francis in 1547 spelled the end of the golden age of the Loire Valley. The royal family moved to Paris to be closer to the political center of France. For most of the next 400 years, Chambord lay empty, impossibly beautiful, and virtually impossible to live in. Various owners and VIP guests took up temporary residence here from time to time, each leaving his or her mark to the extent that much of the feel of the Renaissance chateau was lost. But the central staircase and surrounding galleries remained untouched and were never to lose their power to enchant and intrigue. The double spiral of this staircase made it a favorite place for children to play hide and seek. The wealth of decorative carvings here make it one of the finest examples of the Renaissance carver's art to be found in France, as well as a child's delight. <laughs> Periodically, Chambord showed the signs of neglect. Decorative features crumbled, roofs leaked, and a number of walls threatened to fall down. Under Louis XIV, Chambord came back to life briefly. The Sun King was thoroughly enchanted by this magnificent building, an architectural foreshadowing of Versailles. He began restorations and built this apartment in the center of the keep, leaving the royal wing unoccupied. Wood paneling, hangings, and parquet flooring brought new comfort to the castle.
In keeping with the new fashions of the court, small rooms for maids and servants were added adjoining a few of the main bedrooms. But again, Chambord refused to succumb to domesticity. Although used occasionally as a hunting lodge for the royals and their favorites, most of the time it remained empty. One of the few people to try to live here on a permanent basis was the Marshal of Saxony. He'd been given the chateau by Louis XV after his brilliant victory at the Battle of Fontenoy in 1745. The Marshal moved in lavishly and brought with him two cavalry regiments that he housed in the outbuildings. He tried to solve the heating problem by installing four of these enormous ceramic stoves imported from Germany. The Marshal lived high and hard. A notorious womanizer, he is said to have seduced the famous actress Madame Favard at Chambord. When the Marshal of Saxony died, the cannons of the main courtyard, in keeping with his will, fired a salvo once every quarter of an hour for six days. The building of Chambord was never actually finished. Craftsmen and builders have been at work here, on and off, for nearly 500 years. The restoration goes on to this day, carried out with the same painstaking craftsmanship as under the watchful eye of Francis I. After the masons have set the stone, the stone workers carve out the magnificent details. This F alone will take some three days to complete. Despite the extensive restorations, some of the original stones remain. This one dates from 1533. This is the second major restoration of the Lantern Tower that crowns the central staircase. During the first restoration in the 1700s, workmen removed most of the original structure and stored it under cover from the weather in a ground floor room under the royal apartments. There it remains to this day. Chambord is now a national treasure, a mecca for tourists and a stately hunting preserve for the presidents of France and their honored guests. In one sense, despite the passage of centuries, Chambord is still suspended at a momentous crossroads of history, a time when the romance and superstition of the Middle Ages were giving way to the rationality of the Renaissance. In this, it is a remarkable reflection of the idealistic young man who built it. At the heart of a great forest, the magical vision of a man who was at once medieval knight and Renaissance philosopher king remains. Chambord.